pick the right stock at the right time. Welcome to Bloomberg Quint, you're watching the fine print. As 2018 comes to a close, we're looking back at the landmark verdicts and important developments at the Supreme Court. And to understand the precedents they have set, I'm joined today by Senior Advocate and former Solicitor General of India, Gopal Subramaniam. Uh, Mr. Subramaniam, thank you for speaking to the fine print. Um, I'll start with uh, the recent comments of one of the retiring judges of the Supreme Court, uh, Justice Korean Joseph. And on his last day and, you know, post that, the media interviews, he said that, uh, the f referring to the former CGI, Justice Deepak Mishra, that the CGI was being remote, remote controlled, the allocation of cases was done on, uh, you know, an arbitrary fashion, and sensitive cases were given to judges with a political bias. As somebody who's at the Supreme Court day in and day out, was that your assessment as well? Well, let me put it this way. I think the judges who actually are within the system, they seem to have a better understanding of what really goes on. Really speaking, as professional lawyers, we, we tend to appear before whichever judge or matter is listed. We don't take too much notice. For us, all judges are more or less the same. It's like a job. You have to perform very well, whoever is the judge. But I think... There are some larger issues which are involved in this matter, uh, which is that uh, in a court, there are many issues uh, which are very subtle, uh, such as, let us say, even the optics of how matters are allocated can sometimes indicate uh, about the credibility of an institution. So I think the four judges were also very conscious that the institution of the Supreme Court must never have its credibility impaired. This is not directly to suggest that anybody else was in the wrong or right, but I think higher the credibility requires higher the care. It requires, I think, a lot more introspection of how you deal with matters. Uh, and I think the four judges, and particularly the retiring judge, who has held an enormous esteem, a man of great uh, saintliness, a man above reproach, and for him to have said what he said, uh, it is a matter of some uh, relevance, which should not be lost sight of uh, by the successor Chief Justice or by his companion judges, that uh, the court has such a reputation and integrity which transcends its individuals. Sure. Um, when these four judges uh, came out in January and this, uh, did the media briefing, uh, they drew a lot of criticism within, from within the fraternity, from senior councils, from politicians. Uh, and one of the argument or one of the criticisms then was that the action has made the Supreme Court more, more vulnerable and it has diminished the credibility of the institution that we all you know, hold in such high esteem. Uh, did you, what did you make of the move of these four judges to come out and talk in public, given that they had said that they had uh, tried every um, uh, you know, means to put their point forth before the Chief Justice and left with little recourse? Uh, they had no other option but talk to the media. Well, uh, there are two ways of looking at it. Um, there are many, many traditionalists who believe that judges don't go to the press. I think it's a very valid point. Even I would say that if I was a judge, I would not go to the press. But when you are, say, in the senior most category of judges, your obligations are somewhat different because you're also members of a collegium and you are responsible for the upkeep of the judiciary. Now, I think the way I look at it is that it is not that any of the four judges were unmindful of the tradition that judges don't go to press. I've not seen, in fact, any of the four go to press until that day. 
So there must have been a lot of consternation which was bottled up within them and they felt that they had to breach the dam, literally, because they had to be heard. And unless and until there was some hearing in some space, and also they felt that they owed a duty to the public at large in terms of accountability. When you are the Chief Justice of India, you have to carry your colleagues. And uh, it does require, I think, a great deal of interpersonal dynamics. Um, and the dynamics is two-way. Uh, this has to be also uh, cultured, cultivated. Um, and it is, it is very necessary, I think, for the heads of the institutions in our country, whether they be in the High Court or in the Supreme Court, that uh, they must be very great leaders. Given, uh, Mr. Subramaniam, that this was a first and, in a sense, unprecedented, what have we learned from this incident to ensure that uh, the judges in the Supreme Court don't need to talk directly to the media and they sort out their differences uh, and any apprehensions they have, let's say, on the, on, the, uh, on the very issue of allocation of cases within the Supreme Court itself? Well, let me tell you that the Chief Justice is the master of the roaster. Um, it is entirely up to him where he assigns cases. But we never had a crisis before. But did we have a crisis and was it not known? Uh, let me put it this way. No, we did not have a crisis until now. Okay. It was the first time when it was so perceptible and it had to be addressed. I don't think it could have been brushed under the carpet. Now that it has been brought up above the carpet, uh, any Chief Justice or his successor has to make sure that... Uh, even in matters of allocation of cases, there is some degree of uh, openness and transparency within the community of judges. It is a matter of a roundtable discussion amongst judges, and they can very easily decide how this can be all uh, dealt with. The other factor also, which I think we must bear in mind, which is the other side of the picture, is that suppose judges see that uh, uh, politically sensitive matters are coming simply on their lap. It also places a lot of additional strain on those very judges. So it is not that those judges are simply asking for the cases. They are also in a state of discomfiture. Now, this needs to be clearly understood. So uh, I personally believe that uh, when we have this theory of justice must seem to be done. The Chief Justice ought to have avoided uh, these controversies um, by some more, shall I say, reflection, by some more discussion. I think we could have avoided the controversy. Sure, you've given me a great segue in the next uh, issue that I want to talk about. Uh, you just now said that justice also needs to be seen to be done. Um, did we achieve that in Judge Loya's verdict? Well, I know, I know that uh, there's been a lot of controversy about this, uh, about this case. I personally think that uh, uh, in matters where there is, um, let us say, members of our own judicial community involved, uh, one who is dead and uh, someone who is speaking about the circumstances in which the death happened, it is even more imperative to have an independent inquiry. I'm, I'm very clear. As I said, I respect the judge, I respect his determination, but uh, speaking for myself, uh, this is a great uh, degree of, um, uh, shall I say, uh, a great degree of temptation which one has to avoid to protect your own community because here still was a judge who was dead. That should have worried us. Uh, I'm sure it did worry the court, but I still think that uh, a fair-minded inquiry would not have hurt any of the four judges at all. You're absolutely right. And uh, it would have only, according to me, strengthened the position of the four judges. 
it would have also strengthened the final outcome of the Supreme Court. I think um, I, uh, speaking for myself, as I said, I might have just uh, dealt with it in a different way, to arrive at a fair and a just conclusion. But that is the very least which I think the judiciary owes to itself. It owes that to itself because it has to ensure that judges who deal with difficult cases and uh, there is no shortage of the number of difficult cases must actually be protected. They have to be totally insulated from interferences of any kind. And this is a very important, if I may say so, challenge at the moment, which uh, I'm confident the present Chief Justice is alive to. Uh, I have very great hope in him that he will ensure that insulation happens institutionally, and it must be done institutionally. Okay, let me uh, come to the Supreme Court's verdict now in the Bhima Koregao case. What did you make of the majority view? Uh, you know, the minority said that this was an attempt to quell dissent, whereas the majority upheld judicial discipline. Uh, what is your take on it? I agree with the minority completely. We cannot, I think, silence civil society, and it is, uh, it would be, it, this is exactly what happened in 74. And I don't understand why people don't learn from history. Uh, we must have civil society. We must have organizations which have a different point of view. And there is nothing wrong. The fact that somebody is picking up constantly for landless agricultural laborers uh, doesn't follow necessarily that he has Maoist linkages. I think it's a completely far cry. Somebody who is working for civil liberties of bonded labor, or shall I say, for the rights of uh, once upon a time called the scavengers, are we going to say all oh, these are linked to Maoist uh, organizations? It seems a far cry. We have to have some uh, common sense about this. If we did not have people who worked on the field, India would be an utterly impoverished country. I just want you to know that uh, if you have seen some of the works done by Devaki Jain, it would tell you about the field studies which she undertook, going to different villages, interviewing women, and then writing out her papers. Similarly, I don't think Romila Thapa can ever be described as a person with a Maoist linkage. I mean, she is one of the all-time great historians of the world. And I think we simply must not lose our sense of perspective. Did the Supreme Court then in this case fail to uh, confront political convenience um, versus dissent? Let me put it this way, that I, this is the way I look at it. I, I, I think um, uh, for, a, for any judge, a judge is an instrument of interrogation of authority. That's his fundamental avocation. That is his oath under the Constitution. When you say without fear or favor for a judge, it has a slightly different meaning. It means he will question authority. He's not going to defer to authority. This idea of deference to legislative judgment is in a very qualified sphere. It doesn't apply at all, I'm afraid, to what I think is political judgment, political authority. An executive is amenable to the rule of law. So who is going to actually make them amenable to the rule of law except courts? So courts must question every premise. The history of the Supreme Court has been replete, in my view, with uh, any number of sustained interrogation by the court in the context of fundamental freedoms of people. So the court has been a bastion. It is a history. It has a great tradition. It has a, it has a certain culture. We have to be alive to it. I respect the minority view.
How are you looking at what's happening in the CBI case, uh, the infighting that's going on that has now reached the doorstep of the Supreme Court? What does this uh, particular incident signal? Is the institutional integrity of the CBI in danger uh, and is it a result of the constant or the continuous interference by the exec executive and all of this is unraveling before the Supreme Court now? Let me put it in another way. Uh, let's, let's leave this case apart. I'll leave this case apart for you. I have uh, seen this CBI right from the time C.B. Narasimhan was the first director. I've seen the CBI when Vijay Rabara was the director. It's not the same CBI. That should give you the answer. It's not the same CBI. And how do we make it better? Very simple. You have to make it strictly a professional organization. And the moment you make it professional, the moment you weed out people who have come into the organization on account of certain other reasons, which has happened, mind you, not during the present dispensation at all. These have to be dealt with. You must have an organization with absolutely exceptional people. That was meant to be CBI. But the appointment process itself seems to be fair. It has a mix of the opposition, leader of the opposition yes. party, the prime minister, the CGI. Uh, but once that appointment is done, how do you ensure that uh, it's at a one arm's distance yes. from the executive? Yes. You see, it is not that appointment alone which matters. There are appointments down the line which count. And in all of them, the director may not be able to do anything at all. What happens if there is a first-class director, but you have other people who are appointed, you know, who come in for various other reasons? And uh, no government, and I mean it again, I'm not saying it with reference to any government, I'm saying it with reference to all governments. No government must attempt to capture law enforcement agencies. It's it's, it's the worst thing you can do in a democracy. I would say that this is an extremely good occasion for the government to step back and say, wait. Assuming that the government doesn't no, I'm, do I'm on that. I'm saying, I'm only in the government. I'm saying, is this not a wonderful possibility for the government to take what I would believe as one of the greatest and outstanding initiatives to put this organization in peak order. It can. But that willingness is not there, Mr. No, what, no, no I, uh, the again, point. you see, it's a question of conversation. We are not conver there is, there, you see, there are positions already crystallized and taken. You know, you, let, me, let me explain this to you as a, as a lawyer. And I'm not saying it because I, I, I pride myself on being a persuasive lawyer. But I'm saying that in the discourse of law, whether it is a judge or a lawyer or a legislator or the executive or a minister or the CBI, whatever, we have to learn to communicate and we have to put a certain point of view as futuristic. We have to put that as a point of view in terms of institutional uh, correction. And why should we always believe negatively that positions have been hardened to such an extent it can't be done. I would always like it to be done and I always and this is a, I'm an incurable optimist. But more often than not that change has uh, come from the Supreme Court uh, yes. as a direction to, yes. the, to the government in power. Is this an occasion for the Supreme Court in this particular case uh, to get uh, the institutional integrity of the CBI back in good shape? Let me be very clear. I have no doubt Supreme Court will do what is right. The lead, uh, it goes without saying the institutional integrity of the CBI will always be protected by the Supreme Court. That goes without saying. I mean, Supreme Court... No, to go Supreme to the Court. question... I, no, I'm on a different point. I'm on the point that do you need a verdict from the Supreme Court? When I was a law officer as a solicitor general, I always took the initiative that why do we invite courts? 
to rule against you or for you if you are very clear what is right can be done by you. And I succeeded on numerous occasions. Yes, it needed communication, it needed conversations, it needed opinion writing. But yes, I still succeeded. Let me come to a little bit of your personal journey in the last 40 years. You've been a Solicitor General during the UPA regime and uh, your name was suggested by the Collegium for elevation to the Supreme Court and both in the UPA regime and in the current regime you've had incidents where, uh, if I could, for the lack of a better word, put, may have potentially soured your relationships with the respective governments. In the UPA regime, you resigned because a private lawyer uh, or an outside counsel was hired by the government to hire a particular matter. And uh, in this particular government's regime, you withdrew via a letter your candidature uh, for the elevation of to the Supreme Court. Uh, when you look back now at both these incidents, uh, would you have done anything differently? Uh, let's take the first one. Um, my resignation was on principle. It was not that I had any disrespect to the minister concerned uh, who wanted a private lawyer to be engaged. Um, there was a lack of communication also. But um, I acted out of my own sense of principle, but not that I had any disrespect to him. We're still very good friends. So that you must understand that you can be good friends, but you can act out of principle. So that's one part. The second one is about elevation to the Supreme Court. To be very honest and to be very candid on, a tele on, on an interview, I would say I really looked forward to being a judge. Um, I had stopped practicing and I was really looking forward to it because uh, it, was some, it was a new phase of my life and I thought I was going to enjoy reading and writing and uh, walking about in a big garden uh, and, you know, uh, looking at uh, green and it's, it's all idyllic, somewhat romantic in your head when you wanted to be a judge. To be very honest, um, I saw the first resistance in the form of some stories which were planted in the press. Uh, I want to assure anybody and everybody that uh, uh, n nothing of it was true. Nothing. Um, then I had to take a call uh, after I came to know that uh, four people were recommended and three were suddenly segregated and cleared. And one person, obviously, the name would have to be sent back. I said, I have two options. One is it goes back to the Collegium and the Collegium decides to reiterate my name. Or the alternate is that uh, I, I decide to be in charge of uh, my position because constitutionally I think the segregation was not proper. And uh, so I went public and I revoked my consent. Um, I did it. Um, and I uh, must say that uh, uh, if I had not done it, I would have been a judge. I have absolutely no doubt about it. Uh, Chief Justice Loder was very supportive, very conscious. You asked me a question whether it soured your relations with the government. And this is an insight which you need to know. No. I, 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 I realized that they possibly had a point of view from their standpoint. They thought that uh, I don't know what misgivings they had. They could have asked me directly and I would have cleaned, cleared it up. But uh, sometimes, you know, these things uh, don't work on such transparent parameters of communication. Uh, as you look back uh, at your career and some of the marquee cases that you've argued, um, what have been the most challenging cases that you can think of? Uh, I had uh, to deal with the Parliament attack case. It was a criminal case, and I had Ramjit Malani and Shanti Bhushan on the other side. They were at their best. I've never seen greater arguments by two lawyers, and the way they argued passionately was brilliant. I had to be at my best, and uh, the amount of work was phenomenal. Uh, I also did the 2611 case, 
And uh, there, of course, Justice Aftab Alam and Justice Chandramali Prasad, the quality of hearing which they gave in that matter was outstanding. It was due process at its best. It's, according to me, one of the most sophisticated hearings which one has seen in the Supreme Court. Uh, that's the second case. Uh, I had a tough case, which was Rameshwar Prasad's matter, which was about uh, the governor of Bihar, uh, you know, uh, who, who wanted the house to be, who did not want uh, Nitish Kumar to be called into former government. Um, that was a tough case when we had to support uh, presidential action. Uh, but um, otherwise, it is always a bit of hard work in every case. And uh, you learn as a lawyer in every case. One of the fundamental rules is that even though you may be familiar with the branch of law, it's always good and safe to look it up once again. Because every time you look it up afresh, uh, you have a new, new spurt of spirit in you. All right, Mr. Subramaniam, I let that be the last word on the show. Thank you so much for spending time with the fine print on the landmark verdicts of 2018. And thank you so much for watching. Thank you.